I tell you what, every time you go to these dudes, though, is it's one of those weird ones where you're looking around expecting to see him. I know, I know, and I know just what you mean. Oh, funny. Okay, well, uh, right. For, oh shit, I've not even got it got it on me now, and I've been reading. Paul, what, what's what's the actual title of your book? Just so I can well, put it in. Lot, I mean, it, it, essentially, it's piece by piece. Joy Division. Piece, piece by, by piece, piece. That's it. You're listening to Terry Christian, BBC Radio Manchester, and it's uh, time for a very warm welcome to, uh, well, a Mancunian himself. Stockport lad, really, of course. Paul Morley. Made it big. Left the big city. Uh, he's got a first person, really, to uh, write heavily about Joy Division in Manchester. And uh, there's a book of all his old writings from the enemy days and beyond uh, called Piece by Piece, which is out. Um, were, were they the first band that you fell in love with? Local band, or, or in general. I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a funny sort of way, I guess they weren't even the first local band because just before then there was, there was Howard DeVoto's Buzzcocks that really took my fancy as a, as a local band because, of course, before Howard DeVoto's Buzzcocks, local bands were a little bit Purple Gang and uh, Sad Cafe. There wasn't really such a thing as a local band, so you didn't at first really believe that there could be such a thing as a local band or that they would ever go beyond the local confines. So it was, it was definitely Howard DeVoto's Buzzcocks. And then when they became Joy Division, and there was a sort of strange period in 78 when they changed from Warsaw to Joy Division and got all their power, and then, then I really uh, I fell in love with them. Because in a way, you, you know, because you were so enthusiastic about Joy Division, as their, as as they kind of went up in the world, so did you. And that after you, every every single journalist wanted to make their name by right being the first to write about some band. I think it did start. I mean, it was always in the air that one of the reasons you became a rock journalist was that wonderful moment when you found something and you discovered it, and and you could write about it, and then later you could claim you were there. You know, when there were six people and you were one of the six, that fantastic. Uh, the, I, I, the thing about the Sex Pistols concert, I swear I was there. Actually, that actually came from the Manchester City Swindon game, and I think about '65, where only a few uh, a few thousand turned up. And then for years after, I always remember everyone saying, "I swear I was there at this Man City game," when of course it got its lowest, you know, you know, the lowest City crowd for years and years and years. And it was something about that thing about I swear I was there. And all rock writers love that. They love being in their bedroom writing about something with such passion and enthusiasm, and they're the first ones to do it discovering something and hopefully in, in, in your dreams setting a whole movement in, in you know setting a movement off that you can claim you were there when it all began I, I mean for me you know I, I'd, I'd gone to school with uh, John Ma primary school and secondary school so I was lucky enough to get hold of uh, the spiral scratch and, and see mm. the buzzcocks and uh, in fact it was going to see the buzzcocks when I first saw Joy Division and although I liked them, I did think there was something a bit gloomy about them. So what, what was it, do you think, that... Well, it, it seemed to be all the older blokes who, who seemed more excited about them uh, at well, that time. I, I suppose what was happening with Joy Division is that uh, certainly when they started getting going and they met Martin Hannett and their sound started changing, it was a, it was a prediction in a way what was going to happen after punk when 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 the immediate conciseness of punk started to get a little bit experimental and it became a little bit more musical. And I guess then it was it was the stage beyond punk and it was up. I mean, to some extent, you know, comparing it to to punk when you think about the. Uh, comparing Unknown Pledges by Joy Division, produced by Martin Hannett, to Buzzcock Spiral Scratch, produced by Martin Hannett. It, it was almost like progressive rock. It had moved so far on sonically, and uh, the arrangements were so were so um, adventurous and experimental that, that, that absolutely, the, 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 it seemed a long way from punk, funnily enough. And, of course, it, what, what it became known as very quickly and, and to this day was post-punk. It was a different kind of thing when Johnny Rotten went into public image, when Howard DeVoto went to magazine. All this happened in January 1978, which is incredibly quickly, you know, after punk. And, and Joy Division played their first gig in January 1978. So there was this incredible shift forward. And I think if you were into, you know, banging up and down and, and your dams and your slaughter and the dog, then, then that that next stage was a little bit unexpected because it seemed to be going back almost to to everything that punk had rebelled against, which was you know considered music, complicated lyrics, uh, sophisticated arrangements. Uh, and if you loved a certain kind of uh, music, kraut rock, whatever, you know that, that when Joy Division made that move, it was irresistible, really, combining kind of punk dynamics, Iggy and the Stooges dynamics, with the 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 sense of atmosphere of a can and a craft work. It was for for someone like me who loved both sides of that, it was absolutely you know um, heaven I mean for me it was fantastic because I went down to Polly in London in 1980 and I suddenly mm. found that being Mancunian was, was like cool but what, what I found weird was a lot of the people who like Joy Division there and I'd be like well for want of a better word pulling girls on the strength of them liking Joy Division uh, but 
I, I just sort of thought, well, you know, their fans, you know, a Joy Division gig in Manchester, it was like a football hooligan type crowd, really. Not a load of uh, pensive young men. No, I think that travelled outside Manchester, didn't it? I absolutely agree. There was, um, I mean, you know, once Joy Division got going uh, in, in, in a Manchester sense and the crowd started coming, it was a very visceral experience. It was, it was almost like a, a Led Zeppelin gig, if you like, because, of course, Joy Division Live had such incredible power. On record, they were different because Hannett turned them into a, a, his version of the group. But live, they were so powerful and it was a, a very physical experience. But I think a lot of people outside first heard Joy Division through the albums, through the music. That, that Hannick was putting on record and of course that was a slightly different group because it was a it was almost electro group in a way you know the drums were all sort of squashed down and turned into something else and the little pss, 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 and all these strange noises in the middle distance so when you went along to see Joy Division and you were outside Manchester and you didn't know that side of them I don't think you were quite ready for the for the difference that their live experience was uh, is that something almost peculiar to Manchester bands because the Smiths were like that drunk, you know, bass-willing football hooligan-type crowd when you first went to see them. Stone Roses, bass-willing <laughs> football hooligan. Happy Mondays, be or is it just Manchester? <laughs> I think it's that great dichotomy, isn't it? Because one of the things that happened with Manchester bands, and, so, and maybe it was all down to Devote, Howard Devoto's brain, you know, the, the first real, and Mark E. Smith even, you know, there was an incredible intelligence about what they were doing, even though it was combined to very physical music. And I suppose that's something about the North as well. We've got that side of us that just wants to party and just wants to, you know, have an incredibly good time and lose one's mind. But we've also got that side of us that's exploring and curious and, and wants to show the rest of the world that we're not, you know, you know, a, stupid morons that we actually have something about us beyond that and I guess a lot of the great Manchester bands had both of that where you could just completely you know go crazy to them but there was something else about them that was unique about their take on the world and their perception of the world and I think that was at the heart of the great you know whatever the Manchester music was you know from Buzzcocks on through the Smiths to the Stone Roses and beyond it, it, it had both sides you could take it two ways you could just rave to them or you could sit quietly and contemplate their contemplations. I mean, well, nowadays, you know, when you're sitting in your big mansion right down there, Paul, it, is, there, mansion, it, yeah. <laughs> is there still a kind of pride in you about, about the sort of, or a, an extra interest when you hear about a band coming from Manchester? Yeah, I think I think what what started to happen in that you know from that those two Sex Pistols shows in 1976 and this extraordinary story that keeps coming and, and and to this day we keep trying to find out what it is you know in a way the Joy Division book isn't just me trying to find out about Joy Division it's trying to find out what happened in in Manchester at that time that set off this extraordinary series of moments that do go on to this day and did transform the city and turn it into something else and turn it into an international city a city that you know you you you, you when you think of Manchester now you think of a city of ideas you think of a city that wants to move into the future you think of something that uh, in the late 70s was you know wasn't there at all it wasn't a city necessarily to be that proud of you know you, you lurked about a bit you snuck about a bit and it's interesting that it's become a brand and there's no doubt that uh, you, you know you're constantly trying to work out what that is how did it happen and the incredible way the baton get, kept getting passed on you know from from the fall and magazine and, and joy division to the smiths you know to the stone roses you know to oasis it's it's an incredible story and, and, and i'm ending Endlessly fascinated by it to the extent that it's, it's 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 never nostalgic for me. It really is seeing how history got made, you know, by a bunch of kids that that originally just went to see a, a Sex Pistols show because they fancied, you know, getting off their heads. Uh, and when you were looking back at all your old articles for the Joy Division piece by piece uh, book, did you just kind of think, "Whoa, I didn't say that back then." Was there any cringe moments for you? Thought, "Oh, must take that bit out." Well, there was, and I didn't take them out, but I, I, I particularly, um, I, I, well, I feel it now, my skin's crawling now, when I called the lead singer of Penetration, Pauline, I called her a chick, a chick singer. Uh, and we all fancied her. Post-loaded might think that's not so much, but I tell you, we, we worked so hard to get rid of that language that I couldn't believe I was still using it. But I think you're right, you know, it was a girl singer, and, and then they, they were still the days where you called girls, even Susie, you would say, chick singer. But I thought, now, should I take that out? And I thought, no, the whole point of this is it, this is exactly how it happened. And, and it sounds mad, but we were still calling them chick singers, even if they were in the slits. They, they bit our earlobes off, but we were still calling them chicks. You should have taken out the bit that she's from Newcastle because she was from a concert in Durham, wasn't she? 
Oh yeah, once you start getting particular about it, Terry, absolutely. <laughs> Before that, she was just a Geordie chick. <laughs> I know, it's Geordie chick, absolutely. Or North, and nowadays people come up to me and say, you're not from Manchester, you're from Stockport. But of course, the reason you used to say from Manchester 10, 15, 20 years ago is because no one had really ever heard of Stockport down south. You know, now they're telling you off for claiming you're Mancunian when you're from Stockport. No, that's a good wind-up. That just means you support City. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, again, with all the, you know, obviously you've gone to see the film uh, Control. How, how did you, because I have to say, you know, I was a bit put off by it. I just thought, oh, a black and white film with a sad ending. I don't ever could take another one of those. Well, yeah, a black and white film about suicide. But then again, I think I like the idea of it, you know, being a great northern story, a, a northern love story. I mean, yeah, we know the end. But on the other hand, if these things don't get turned into film, then they don't become part of history. Uh, and I think there's that, that fight between whether we're just being misty-eyed and nostalgic for something or whether we actually know that we have to start, you know, putting these things into history. Otherwise, it gets lost and the, and the moment goes and other things get talked about. And this is a great moment. And the more, you know, films that get made, the more great films that get made, the more it does become part of, a, of history and it will never be removed. So I think it's all about legacy now. I mean, we're talking about that a lot lately with bands coming back and everything, you know, being revived and reunions and everything. But I think it is an important moment in history that, that this this moment, just as we all, you know, uh, the first lot of pop culture people start dropping off, everyone's very keen on making history. And of course, our great, our great mentor Tony Wilson was was the master of that, setting up history, making sure that the history got told in whatever way was was going to make that history reverberate, even if it was made up of a lot of lies. And I think that's why the the factory, the Joy Division story, the Manchester story is being told in lots of different ways now, because we were all set up by our great mentor Wilson to make sure that it entered history i mean it would take, i mean everybody you know had their arguments with tony and then you know but you couldn't help liking him and i was going to say for you you know and i've had the same thing you know but then when i think everything you know every bit of prejudice in me almost he's influenced you know even doubt that this idiot idiot idea that he should never leave manchester Oh, the, yes. Well, I, yeah, obviously, I pulled away quite quickly, and he never forgave me. And for months on end, uh, at times, he wouldn't speak to me because of it. But then I kind of know what he meant, and, and in a way, I've ended up doing, I hope, fulfilling what he, he wanted from me, which was to become a kind of historian of a period. I mean, that's what he wanted from me. Uh, and, and, and much against my you know, instinct, because at times you do hate him for, for seeming to bully you or push you or, or create, you know, you know, do you know what I mean? And, and at times I hated him so much, it's only lately as, as you get a little older and you, and you realise the shape of things that I realise that I am following what he wanted to do and I have been inspired by him. And like you, I ended up doing things I never thought I'd end up doing. And I realise now in hindsight it was a lot to do with Wilson. That, that it, you know, the, the idea that I was a shy little writer and I ended up becoming quite an extrovert broadcaster. And I realised after a while it's because Wilson had created that template. You could do lots of different things. You know, very un-English thing in a way, that, that idea of being a, you know, the jack of all tries, the dilettante. The English don't usually like that. Uh, I, I, that happened to me without a doubt because Wilson was in our local landscape and he did a lot of different things and as much as sometimes you hated that, it, it was incredibly influential. Uh, I, I, because, uh, you know, the frightening thing for me is the more the more I think about it, you know, I mean, this has almost become accepted wisdom now in Manchester is that you don't leave if you make it. Yes. Even yeah. if you're threatened by gangsters like a certain well-known band were and that's why they moved out of London. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know, I know, and, 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 and Tony was very much on that very early on to the, to the extent that when I did it in the, in the late 70s because I got a job at the NME and, of course, that was an incredible thing at the time. I mean, it, it's difficult to, to describe what it was like now because there's so many opportunities. There's so many opportunities to stay in Manchester and be able to earn a living talking about pop culture, but they were like, it sounds crazy, but the late 70s were like the dark ages. But God bless Tony Wilson. I have to tell you, when I said I was going, I'd got a job at the NME, he got me a bloody interview at Granada Television to, to, to be a researcher on some godforsaken show trying to keep me, you know, in, in, you know trying to give me a job because I said, look, I need a job, Tony. I've got this job. I can't not go. And he said, I'll get you a job. And, he, and he, I failed the interview, as you probably could tell, because I did leave in the end. But it, but, it, but it was about something that to him was so important even before you really understood why it was important. You know, you just thought he was just being a bully in a way, you know, stopping you, you know, um, spreading your wings. He was, he was holding you back, you felt. In fact, what he was trying to do was actually encourage you to, to, you know, lift you to greatness. And it's only later, once I'd gone through all the moments of not talking to him, of, of being annoyed with him, infuriated with his behaviour, that I realised what an incredible, generous spirit it was and how many... He was like this kind of mad, metaphysical commissioning editor, you know, 
spotting talent, encouraging it, giving it the opportunity, whether it was Hanny or Gretton or me or you or, you know, Middles or Cummins or whatever, loads of people, you realise ultimately, what he, you know, Vinnie Riley, all these incredibly disparate talent he was focusing and, and giving it the, the most incredible lift. Uh, and, and, and now I realise how incredibly important that was. I mean, what I find weird about him was because, you know, you'd have arguments with him, but I remember, like, ringing him up when I got the job on the word because I'd never presented any telly before, and I, went, and, I went, and, I, and I was having arguments with people thinking that I should have control over everything, and I rang him up and yeah. said, Tony, you know, when you present a TV show, how much say should you actually have in it? And he went... About 14%, darling. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I hung up. I thought, oh, thanks, Tony. <laughs> yes. Well, that was the funny thing about his life, that on one, on one hand, he had to be the broadcaster and he had to uh, kind of have a kind of weird self-control that was so unnatural to him. I often think that he, he kind of formed factory records to get all that anarchy out of his system that he couldn't get out of his system at Granada. You know, the two sides of his personality, the, the incredibly charming you know, almost irritating daytime television personality and, and the post situation is an anarchist and he had to have both sides of his, of his character come out, otherwise he would have gone mad, you know. And did you find that you, you cared about what he thought, even when oh, you, you oh, didn't? <laughs> no, absolutely. Even when we, we were arguing on live TV and I, I was trying to fight back in the only way I thought was correct, which was Wilsonian in a way, <laughs> I still noticed that when I wrote something, whenever I did anything, you know, you have something in your head, you have a few people in your head you're trying to impress. That in that, in that little bunch of people, Wilson's face would always be there. You know, I always wanted Wilson, I guess, to be proud. I wanted Wilson to uh, appreciate what I was doing. I wanted Wilson to see that I did understand what he was talking about, about the history of the North, about Manchester, about that spirit. And wherever I was going in the world, whatever else I seemed to be doing, however far away from the North I seemed to be moving, I was still following his principles. He was an annoying get like that. Because I was thinking, why? Why should annoying. I be bothered? <laughs> I know, and I would do these incredible things, and then he would hate it simply because it wasn't about one of his acts, you know. Yeah, that's right. But you knew deep down, you knew deep down that ultimately he was an incredibly generous, idealistic, optimistic, encouraging spirit. And as damned annoying and as dogmatic and as stubborn as he could be, at, the, at, at his heart, he had incredible heart. I mean, this is the thing, uh, um, you know, I. You know, because, I, I mean, I really got to, you know, sort of like him more and more over the last 10 years, you know. In yes. it. And it was, it was one of those, uh, when he died, I, I mean, he's not one of my family, but I, I've, a lot of people have spoke to like that. It's like you really ended up missing him a lot. I mean, it will be different to, to you because you're in London, I suppose, but it's almost as if, well, who do I care now who thinks anything about what I do anymore? Well, even though I'm in, you know, down south, I think there's still the sense of the spirit, and and it was a, a spirit that I, I I must admit I was quite complacent about. He seemed, as much as you'd go, you know, for and against and fight and and be friendly and love and hate. I always thought he'd be around. I thought he'd be around. He was the kind of character, the, the remarkable character I thought would be around if, if forever, really. You know, he'd live into his 80s and he'd always be battling away. Uh, so yeah, when it did go, it was a huge uh, emptiness. And when you, you know, when I come up to the north and do events, they're the kind of events and readings and interviews and bits and pieces, whatever that Tony would either be hosting, or be with me on. So it's 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 like really strange to do them now, and he's just not there. But yet he kind of is. It, what I find interesting, you know, you can sense that the the bolshy nature of 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 that northerness, the the wanting to establish their identity, definitely has been folded around the ego and the personality of Wilson. So even though there's this huge emptiness, you know, when I did something the other week with Hooky, you know, and I thought I know that I'm just a replacement for Tony here, but uh, which, which you know, the the other week I gave an award to Savile for <laughs> lifetime achievement, and I thought I know I'm the replacement for Wilson, and that made me. A both incredibly moved that, that I'd done it, that, that you know, if they're going to call upon a replacement for Wilson, I'd be one of the characters. And also how, how awful it was that just as that history is really establishing itself, he's missing. But then what an amazing moment that was, because somehow it falls into the idea of the incredible publicity seeker he was, even causing his own death creates a kind of weird publicity for himself because then, my God, he becomes the kind of, you know, the, the legend that at times he, he kind of knew in his, in, in his behaviour he was going to become and we didn't really believe him. Oh, I don't know about that because uh, one of the weird things about Tony is that he was never a snob. He was always very approachable. I mean, I first, you know, spoke to him, and, and not in a particularly nice way, when he was 16, mm. you know, having a go mm. at him, get more reggae on, so it goes. No, you know what? All, <laughs> yeah, but he talked to me, he ended up talking to me for yeah, about I, 10 I, minutes. I know. Well, what's funny about that, I think all of us, our first dealings with Wilson is that we insulted him. I think he must have just had everybody that, you know, you know now remembers saying, well, I went up to him, I, I slagged him off. 
And it was the same with me. The first time I ever came across him, it was like, you know, it was a, it was a, a, an F off moment. You know, go away, you were embarrassing me. Uh, and yet he put up with all of that. And then, and then you know, he, he, he ignored it. He just carried on, you know, and, and eventually befriended you. You know, even though, you know, his memory of you the first time he met you was you were slagging him off. <laughs> I don't. I don't think. I don't think he could remember half the stuff that that he did. Well, maybe uh, that's so. what it was. Maybe he just had a, a, a terrible memory and forgot. Or maybe that was. It. I sometimes wondered if it was just thick skin, but maybe it was just that he just knew that really, you know, it, it, there was a part of him that was like that. That incredible nerve you need to to behave a certain way in public. You know, he he, he was he had he had that in in you know in in, in bucket loads. And I guess he realised that you know uh, because he was uh, at, for a time. The, about the only local celebrity we had when you would see him in a club it was a peculiar moment you know it was like john stapleton suddenly being there but yet yet you were seeing the fall so you were kind of annoyed really that he'd spoilt it a little bit in his bloody showbiz suit you know so you, you slagged him off but on the other hand you were quite you were quite impressed that he'd done it that he turned up you know and are you annoyed that he's not seeing your book now joy division piece by piece yeah, I, I, absolutely. And the funny thing was, even you know, even as I was writing it, I, I was thinking, you know, I, I must get it to him. I must get, it, I must tell him. And then I thought, no, I just wanted it to be a surprise. I just wanted it to turn up. So I never even told him I was doing it. And then just as I was about to finish it, he died. And then I, you know, and it was just like unbelievable. It was like unbelievable. Almost on the day that I was literally about to finish the last word of the book, he died. And of course, he had to be in the book. So it's like you go, you bugger, Wilson. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do some more work now. And then you thought, oh bugger, he won't see it, you know. And and he he didn't see control. Uh, and and you just think, oh, well, that, that, absolutely the, the the enormity of how sudden it was. Even though we were kind of prepared, it was still unbelievably sudden because you just knew that he he, he really should have been around to see all this really become history, you know. And I guess there was also a weird thing that happened as well. It was a bit like when Peel went, and there was this weird. Um, a, a attempt from from the BBC to how do you replace Peel? And I noticed that the only way they could ultimately try and replace Peel was by you know having about 35 different DJs you know play, have a show. And I thought it's a bit like that with Wilson. It's going to need all of us, me and you and a, and a few other people, to even get close close to replacing this one guy. We better start learning some quotes. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've, we've got to elevate our, our knowledge and our, our true... His, but he was he was a fantastic historian, wasn't he? And, I, and what was interesting, he brought the intellectual side of being a historian to play and actually started to create history himself. Oh, fantastic. Uh, do you know, I, I'd done that book about the word, you know, my word, but it's about TV in the 90s and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so when I rang him up about two weeks before he died, you know, because I wanted to co come and see him, and he said, well, I've just got a cl clot on me, on me lung, and I went, oh, fucking hell, so yeah. And he said, oh, no, it's not the cancer, that's all right. And I said, oh, well, I, you know, I wanted to you know, I wanted to come and see you and also, you know, give you a copy of the book because you're in it. And he went, yeah. I'd love a copy of your book, darling. <laughs> you know, but it was oh. like... You know, he was just too ill, and you, everyone yeah. had that feeling that he just wasn't going to be around, you know, for much longer. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, oh, gutted, man. Really, really weird. Really weird, I have to say. You know, well, cause... he's left behind that, you know, that legacy that we know now. We've got something to carry on. I, th I find that quite exhilarating too. You know, that that it gives it, it gives what could become very frivolous. This this <laughs> business, it gives it kind of meaning, doesn't it? You know, you know that there is a meaning to it. That you you can you can do incredibly powerful things. You know. But also, just how, I mean, even, you know, away from that, you know, the stuff, uh, you know, the, how, how much you loved, you know, being on TV when I was doing that, you know, really cheap uh, TV review show. There was, um, oh, yeah, we, yeah. We, we showed a clip of uh, some well known Channel 4 comedian, let's say, who's yeah. not to everyone's yeah. taste. And I said, so, so I just said, because you didn't have to work hard on you had Tony Lee. So, so sure. what do you reckon, Tony? And he went, he went, well, when I watch television, I'm basically inviting that person on television into my living room. And I don't want to twat like that in my living room. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I know. Thank, thank the Lord that he cut to it. You know, because uh, uh, well, as you well know, the further south you go, you know, that kind of attitude is avoided. But you want a bit of that, don't you? Just some truth, you know. And wh why? I mean, I mean, that's just a peculiarity. Why are they frightened of, of that? Because uh, the one thing about Tony is he wasn't mm. precious. So, no, you know, he wasn't going to go weeping into his pillow because someone disagreed with him or didn't That's like right. his idea. Well, in fact, he preferred that, didn't he? I think he got, 
He, he, he was more upset if he felt that people started... I, I know in the last few months he very much hated it. People started to be nice to him, you know, because <laughs> he, he liked the tension, didn't he? He liked the battle, and I, and I, and I, I suppose that, that, was, that was what I loved about him, that, that you, he was one of the few people that you could um, have a real argy-bargy with. You could really sort of slag off it in a way, slag off his arguments, and he didn't take it personally, you know, and the next time, you know, it, 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 it would be OK. You know, I, I, funnily enough, it took me a little bit of time to get used to that, you know. Uh, that almost the fact that he treated everyone like part of the family and the whole point about being part of the family is you can have big arguments but it, it can carry on you know weird it's all that bunch of young out with smoking dope in those days you know <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's down to hey listen Paul thanks a lot for that I'll have to bung this now for someone someone to edit and I'll uh, no, no clip, problem, clip in a bit about Tony because uh, there's some really good stuff in there it's just uh, you know just people talking about him though it's like um but funny, you know, loads of funny stories. No, C.P. Lee no. about, about his stag night, where they all dropped acid and went to see Fast Breeder at this rough pub in Hardwick. Fast Breeder? <laughs> well, it was Jerutty Collin, wasn't it? <laughs> and it was like, that was his stag do, you know, before he married. It, it, it is funny, because, you, know, we, you know, we've obviously had the films down, the documentaries, and, and, and the funny thing is I never tire of them, because there was, you know, what you've just said already, you, you want to see that in a film and a documentary. <laughs> that, so many other stories, you know, I want to see Toss Ryan's story, do you know what I mean? I want to see oh, C.P. Yeah. Lee's story, because all, all their stories are, are just as, as magnificent, and, and, and all their story, and all our stories every single one of them wilson features well yeah well salts as well you know a jazz defectors who ended up being yeah. like mick Utnell's <laughs> pulling partner and he was saying the first time and it was like uh what is it acr because he was mates with some of them salts and uh they were playing in uh buxton or derby or somewhere and so tony yeah. gave him a lift and he said yeah. he'd never met him before and he said and he was driving doing about 200 mile an hour down all the you know sat down the a6 or whatever all these little wind this little windy road in the dark skinning yeah. a spliff up with one hand but actually turning round to the back seat to talk to him he said he was yeah. shitting himself <laughs> oh man I know he used to like, he, for little love, he used to like, he always used to like driving onto the moors as well, you know, these weird moments when he'd suddenly drive out there, you know, sort of uh, a, a strange sort of combination of, of, of characters, wasn't he, you know? And his bloody dog. Oh, I don't his know. His bloody dog, yeah. No, and he'd always turn up fire, just exactly on time. Yeah. But you wouldn't be able to contact him all day when he was supposed to come yeah. in and do something with you. And then he'd just yeah. be there, you know. Nah. 